This is the Ryan X13 VertiJet, capable of uh, taking off and landing vertically, uh, mounted on the uh, back of a truck. Uh, this was a revolutionary airplane in the mid-1950s, and Aurora Models was chosen to make the model kit representing this incredible experimental airplane. Or was it? Let's find out on Celebrating Aviation with Mike Mashat. The amazing tale of Ryan's X-13 VertiJet. How Aurora models wound up producing the kit that was just about to be released by Ravel. Really? Yes, we're going to tell you the story. First, a quick reminder, if you haven't signed up on our VIP subscriber list, please do. Link is in the title block, and we now have a new bi-monthly newsletter, and I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Also, if you're in the L.A. area on Friday, uh, this coming Friday, February 2nd, and you'd like to meet Max of Max's Models and yours truly, we are going to be at the Proud Bird Restaurant on Aviation Boulevard near LAX. I'll post a reminder in the middle of this week, but uh, we'll be there dinner time. Uh, if you're in the area, would like to meet and uh, come on down, have a bite and talk about airplanes and models, we'd love to see you. And now back to our program. This is a Convair F-102 interceptor. It needed a runway uh, roughly eight to 10,000 feet long to operate. And most air bases uh, back in that time period had runways anywhere from 10 to 12,000 feet. Uh, that was that was required for jet fighters, jet bombers, interceptors uh, to uh, fly from air bases literally around the world. But this airplane, the Convair Pogo and the Lockheed Salmon were developed as experimental prototypes to test the concept of VTOL or vertical takeoff and landing. Meaning they didn't need a runway, they could land aboard a ship. And it was Ryan Aeronautical Company in San Diego, California that evolved uh, the idea into a jet VTOL airplane. And this concept became the X-13. Here's the X-13, one of two under construction in San Diego. And there's the cockpit, fairly simple, but uh, very efficient. And here we have uh, Pete Girard, the chief test pilot on the program for Ryan. And this is taken on the lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base. There were two X-13s built. Uh, ship 620, you see there on the right, was fitted with conventional landing gear. And this was the phase one testing for uh, evaluating the aerodynamics and how the airplane was going to handle. And it took off and landed like a conventional airplane. Uh, ship 1, 619, is seen there on the left. And that was uh, a vertically oriented airplane with a test rig. This was flown from the ground and then eventually uh, mounted to a truck bed. The engines are the same as the Caravelle that you see there, the Rolls-Royce Avon turbojet. First flight of the wheeled airplane was December 10th, 1955. First flight of the test rig in vertical orientation was May 28th, 1956. The test rig was then fitted to a Fruhoff trailer and was erected into the vertical position in preparation for the first free vertical flights. Here we see a view looking down from the top of the uh, trailer and notice that the uh, tar strips on the ground there uh, in between the concrete uh, sections uh, is actually melted and blown away from the engine exhaust. Well, on the morning of April 11th, 1957, the X-13 was ready to prove its metal and it made the first flight from the trailer and that was a very successful airplane in that role. Uh, it was able to maneuver and then transition into vertical flight and made a number of high-speed passes before transitioning back uh, into the vertical. Here we see a nice view of it. Uh, top speed was uh, roughly 350 miles an hour. And then transitioned back to the vertical and came in for a landing with the nose hook that you see there uh, trapping on the uh, cable at the top of the trailer. There's a nice color shot. In July of uh, 1957, uh, the airplane was trucked to Washington, D.C. and put on a very impressive performance uh, from the parking lot of the Pentagon. The uh, first airplane, Ship 619, is on display at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. 
and 620 uh, is on display at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. Well, about the same time period, Ravel Models of Venice, California, uh, about an hour and a half, two hour drive up from San Diego back in those days, uh, was producing a new line of model kits. Uh, this is a 148 scale F-102 Delta Dagger, and it came with ground equipment, removable engine, operating controls, all sorts of really cool detail. Uh, this model sold for $2.98. We'll tell you what happened in a moment. But uh, Ryan was uh, very enamored of this concept and wrote to Ravel with a proposal that they make a model of the X-13 VertiJet. And Ravel did just that. They were very excited about the concept. This was a, uh, getting a lot of publicity. It was in Life magazine, all the media at that time, all the newsreels uh, you'd see in a movie theater. And so Ravel was pretty excited about it. And they pr uh, produced a test prototype model uh, in one thirty-second scale. And look at this detail. The trailer erected into the vertical position came with a tow tug, uh, figures, um, and just an amazingly detailed model. Look at the underside of the trailer, the hydraulic arms, everything operated. It was just like having a miniature X-13 in your room. Uh, the kicker, though, was that the uh, controls, uh, from what I understand in the proposal, uh, the controls were operated from the cockpit. You could actually, they were interconnected. You could control them with the stick and then the engine was removable, and you see that there, Rolls-Royce Avon. But it was 132nd scale, released in late 1958. That was the target date. Uh, $2.98 retail price in the store, a fully detailed cockpit, fully detailed removable engine, interconnected operating controls, a Mongo Mega model. There was just one little problem. By mid-1958, it was determined that the F-102 kit was not selling very well. $2.98 doesn't seem like much today, but that was a lot of allowance. And uh, you had to save up and you got one big model. Uh, and I think what was happening is Ravel was competing with themselves in that you could buy three 98-cent models uh, for that same price. And so uh, as an antidote, Ravel re-released the kit without all the extra ground equipment for $1.98, a little bit better, but not a big seller. And so Ravel President Lou Glazer had a strategic decision to make. And just before this was to go into production, he canceled the project. Ryan, not to be outdone, uh, contacted Aurora Models in West Hempstead, New York, about uh, 3,000 miles away on the East Coast, and convinced them to make a model, although it was smaller and simpler uh, it was approximately 148 scale, somewhere in that area, and uh, just a, a non-operating uh, controls and just simpler model to produce. And this sold for $1.98. So that's how the Aurora X-13 VertiJet came to be. But had things worked differently, it would have looked like this. And there you have it, a look at the X-13 VertiJet from the mid-1950s. Special thanks to the wonderful folks who made this episode possible. And thank you so much for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. We really appreciate you uh, looking at these videos. We enjoy the making them very much. And uh, please do subscribe if you haven't. We'd love to have you on board. Until next time, take care. <laughs>